Hi, I'm Dr. Yosef with Daring. Um, as many of you may know, I'm a former FDA medical officer, board certified psychiatrist. I do forensic work when it comes to uh, adverse reactions from psychiatric medications. And um, today I'm jo joined by Naomi Moore and uh, her husband uh, died of a drug-induced suicide from uh, a combination of medications, uh, but antidepressants and antipsychotics. And uh, she's graciously agreed to come here and and share what I think is a really important and powerful story about how your life can change in a matter of five months from being seemingly okay to you know a completely tragic outcome. And it's you know I've heard her story. It's it's completely representative of how these things can evolve. And I just think it's very useful. Um, to kind of hear it because it's really something that can happen to anyone. So Naomi, thank you so much for having the courage to join us and talk about something that um, really still is quite fresh. You know, this is, a, it's nearly been one year since John passed and uh, it's just so important. So thank you so much for coming on and agreeing to talk. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think what's most useful, uh, is is to start kind of chronologically. Um, um, why don't you kick us off just telling us how, I guess, this all started from from your perspective? Yeah, um, John had recently started a new job, and um, it was kind of out of his wheelhouse. He was a registered nurse for almost thirty years. Um, it was kind of out of the clinical side of nursing and and working with um, you know addicts and and things like that and doing wound care and things like that where he had mostly worked in pediatrics. Um, so start of a new job, um, he had lost his dad a year prior and then his mom wasn't doing well. And so, um, you know, because there's no medical record of why he was prescribed the Zyprexa, um, I'm kind of going off the text of um, that he had with his doctor who in, you know, full disclosure was his own brother um, and he, they ended up in the ER one night cause his mother wasn't doing well. And the text from that, that's the kind of the time period where he, I think he was having a lot of anxiety. He'd been saying he thought he maybe needed to go live with his mom and take care of her. She'd been falling, things like that. Um, and her ending up in the ER, I think he was really, really worried about her. And he left the house that night and said, my mom's dying. I said, no, your mom's not dying. Um, and he met his brother in the ER, and I believe that's where the Zyprexa was prescribed. And, and um, he, his brother texted him a couple days later, said, how's the new med? Um, and he said, you know, very flat affect with a sad face, um, but has helped with constant worrying. Um, and, I so and I just want to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in here. So John was, I mean, he had he was also on an antidepressant though at the time, you know, he'd been on one for right. quite some time. Right. And what was it again? It was Lexapro that he was on and he had okay. always started and stopped it, taken it on and off for years. You know, if he would get agitated, he would say something like, well, I guess I need to go back on my Lexapro, mm -hmm. but he wasn't a depressed person. He wasn't, he wouldn't stay in bed. I mean, he always was like, come on, mama, we got to get up while the sun's shining, bell hay while the sun's shining. He was always loved being outside, loved being with his family. He just, mm -hmm. he, you know, he took it, I think, for moodiness and agitation, yeah. which his brother he'd, had prescribed years ago. He'd never had a suicide attempt, never, never, never self-harmed, no. you know, anything like that. Okay, so we have someone at least, you know, and we're looking, we're looking back at this, you know, and, you know, I know after this happened, you looked at all of these medical records, but when you described it to me at the time, I mean, this was, like he was stressed, clearly. He was starting a new job. He was worried about his mother. You know, he was on an antidepressant, but um, he was still working, you know. And, and so he goes there and then he gets prescribed Zyprexa by his brother. Um, and, and, and typically what, you know, you might hear Zyprexa and think, you know, hardcore medication for schizophrenia and bipolar. And that's true, it is. But in some instances, it can be used uh, with an SSRI medication for tr what's called treatment resistant depression. Now, I don't know if that's what John had. Uh, I mean, to me, it doesn't really sound like it. If, if we're talking about contextual stresses, starters, such as starting a new job or, you know, being worried about his mom, but that's, that's what happened to him. He ended up on a treat on a medication regimen for treatment resistant depression, you know, severe depression. And okay. And I'll, I'll go back to you, Naomi, tell us what happened next. And I yeah. have, 
Yeah. Yeah. And I have read that about Zyprexa of on the medication guide and it states, you know, for that treatment resistant depression only after two other failed med attempts, or is that typical with antipsychotics? So, you know, he had only ever been on the Lexapro. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's about, the, so the, that's, the, you know, where they say that. Yeah. I mean, Treatment yeah. resisted by definition is, you know, and I, and I, I don't recall exactly what is in the drug labeling. Sometimes they say after one failed treatment, sometimes they say after two, but, you know, in terms of thinking about things that you would do, you know, you know, waiting, you know, um, counseling, you, know, you may be increasing the dose. Right. He might've been on the maximum dose. I don't know, but if he wasn't, you could increase the dose of the Lexapro, but there's a, or, or, you know, if that didn't work, you could say, you know, maybe Lexapro is not the right drug for you. Let's try you on something else, you know, Wellbutrin, Mirtazapine, you know, another medication that, you know, has less side effects and, and such, and, you know, doesn't cause the same degree of weight gain and I guess other problems, which you'll hear about that Lex, uh, that Cyprexa right. can cause. But um, so it seems like he was expedited onto a pretty heavy medication uh, quickly with without other therapeutic options, Um um, in between. And, and I don't know if John said no to right. those or, or whatever, but we can only assume that, you know, it just kind of went there and got prescribed it, which is pretty common in from, from what I've seen. So yep, yeah, please no, Naomi, go on. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so we started taking the Zyprexa, um, and he started talking really about memory. I think memory, um, he kind of just started distancing himself. Um, he'd stay in the bedroom a lot. Um, but memory was a big thing. Um, I just can't read, hun, you don't understand. I don't know what's wrong with my memory. And I just say, we're all getting older. We're all losing our memory. And he'd just say, no, you don't, you don't understand. And he would never give me specifics. Um, and I just kind of brushed it off and, you know, just, okay, whatever. He's stressed about his new job. He's, you know, just the typical, he's just figuring that out. Um, and then he just, he came home one day from work and had had a full on panic attack um, and just said, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know what's wrong with me. Um, and he started saying that too, like, I, I don't know what's wrong with me. And um, he had the panic attack at work, came home. Um, his boss told him to take a few days off. He tried, I think, to go back into work a day or two and just couldn't do it. Um, talked to his boss. She said, let's, let's maybe actually that was after he got checked into the psych unit. So within a little bit, he was texting his brother saying, um, you know, he was also on <laughs> tramadol, which he had had two hip replacements years before. Um, he had taken that for pain. So he began to think he was an, he was an addict. Um, According to his pharmacy records, he was prescribed 60 tablets every six months, and that's what he had been. Um, he had taken. He said he had taken half a tablet to a full tablet of tramadol every day. Um, if you saw John, you knew he was in pain in the way he walked, and he, I mean, but he still skied. He water skied. He, you know, he he was a pretty active person. Um, he went to his brother thinking he was an addict. I remember him sitting down and said. You know, this is the time when he's starting to move his knee up and down, sit in the chair and just constantly move his knee up and down and kind of do thing to tell you I'm an addict. And I said, he told me he's been taking half a tablet to a full tablet of Ultram every day, almost every day. And um, mm -hmm. I said, are you lying about the dosage? Because that's to me no different than someone coming home and having a glass of wine after work or, you know, a couple beers. I mean, that, I mean, maybe I was enabling or something, but he said, no, I threw them all down the toilet. Um, so this increased paranoia of kind of who he was. Um, he went to his brother, said he was an addict. Um, his brother, who actually also is a doc at the alcohol treatment center, um, also just said, no, I said, do you think he's an addict? And he said, no, I just think he has a dependency, but he's a, not an addict. So mm. John became increasingly more, more paranoid about this. And one of his texts, you know, he asked about serotonin syndrome, um, asked his brother about serotonin syndrome, if there's any tests for serotonin syndrome, um, if he's ever seen anyone um, 
act like this after being on tramadol this long. And his brother said, I've seen people with a lot, you know, that have been taking a lot more tramadol than you have um, and been just fine. Yeah. And well, l- l- let me interrupt because there's a few, there's a few interesting threads, which I, I think are use, useful to pull on. And that's um, it's, you know, when you look at a drug label for an antidepressant or an antipsychotic medication, you know, um, you know, a lot of them say, you know, may increase the risk for suicidal behavior. You know, it's a black, it's a boxed warning. It's one of the highest warnings a right. drug can get, but what they don't really explain is, how it presents. And I think this is why uh, John's story is so powerful. And I want to go into some of the symptoms, um, uh, which I think at least suggest to me that there's something drug induced going on, you know? Um, So pretty severe cognitive impairment seems to have struck John pretty, pretty quickly afterwards. You know, I know you mentioned to me last time we, we spoke, I mean, he, he was literally writing things down on like, you know, post-it notes and, and, and flashcards to, to prepare for things. You know, he, he had such a rapid deterioration in his ability, in his working memory and his ability to do things. Um, so one that kind of strikes me as, as quite unusual. Um, the other thing was he's, you know, he's having a, like a lot of panic attacks all of a sudden as well you know for someone that didn't have panic attacks Mm -hmm. in the past when he was anxious to all of a sudden have panic attacks that's that's a change you know if john had panic attacks in the past and that's just how his you know anxiety manifests when it's severe for him that would be less significant but for all of this to start after the zyprexa again points to maybe a drug-induced phenomenon and then um the audio was cutting out for a little bit but i caught you describing how he looked when he was sitting down and how he would sit down and his leg would kind of shake up and down and that he would pace and move a lot. I mean, could you, I mean, is that true, right? You, you, I, I recall you saying that, that there was yeah. a lot of restlessness. Um, and so it's kind of like, so the, there's that as well. And then the other thing that is typical, not just for antipsychotics and antidepressants, but also benzodiazepine medications is it can cause, you describe it as paranoia, but it's, it's almost this, this mental dysphoria where you can kind of get stuck in this like OCD type of loop where you obsess right. about little things like, you know, I'm addicted to the tramadol, you know, and, and he's taken this tramadol long term, you know, stable dose. He's not, he's not abusing it. He's not buying it on the street. But now in his head, you know, he's just perseverating, you know, I'm this addict on this tramadol. And so he's experiencing a whole constellation of symptoms, which are really unusual. And I want to say this as well. It's one of the limitations of the diagnostic system in the, you know, for psychiatry all over the world is that, you know, there's no lab tests or anything like that. It's all based on a list of symptoms, you know, and, and, and so that's why these things are so frequently missed because if if you're not aware of them, you could just say, oh, okay, you know, he's, He's got anxiety, panic attacks. Oh, he's just like restless. That's because he has lots of anxiety. Oh, he's got cognitive problems. Yeah, you know, sometimes people who have depression com- complain, you know, it's, I'm having a hard time thinking. And so it's very easy for some people to just say, this is depression and put it in the box. But once you know what you're looking at, I mean, the nature of how John changed um, from before the Zyprexa to afterwards, I mean, it's a completely new, you know, uh, it's completely new symptoms that are not typical for him. And that's what we're really looking for with these cases. It's a drastic change in the quality of their suffering, which is unusual. And that's what I think was really powerful about your, your, you know, your story. So yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Hmm. Yeah. Um, no, that was it too. And that con- it, just constantly saying, this isn't my husband, but then <sighs> him also thinking, I think in, hmm. By him reaching out to his brother and constantly, you know, saying, you know, is there a test for serotonin syndrome? And, you know, just kind of the cavalier approach to no, no test. And almost, I think that almost played with John's head too, of like, this is just me and this is how I am now. And that did damage in just not seeing the symptoms or the side effects of what these drugs can cause like that can do damage to people as well when they're gaslit and saying, no, it's you, it's stress. It's, you know, it's, it's stress. It's not the pills and not reassessing those medications. So. 
that's mm-hmm. I just wanted to throw that. Um, no, no, it's it's, yeah, it's a so he, it's well, yeah. I was just going to say it's a it's a really valid point that um, you know, it's one thing going through this suffering, you know, which you know words can't really describe it, but if I were to try, it's a dysphoria, you know, an intense kind of sadness and anxiety coupled with severe restlessness as well. And your mind is completely hijacked. And, um, you know, it's one thing being in this state of mind and understanding like, oh, I have a toxicity, you know, when my mind is saying these crazy things, at least I have that rational thought where it's like, you know, this is, you know, this is a drug induced reaction. I'm going to stop the drug. I'll be fine. I'm just going to hang in there. But if you don't hear that and people just keep on saying, you know, it's your underlying condition, it's your depression, you know, it's, it's, it's just what's going on. There's just this powerlessness that comes with it. You know, like you were saying, Naomi, you know, there's something wrong with me. There's something wrong with my brain, which, um, uh, I mean, makes you feel hopeless. Absolutely. No, you Mm. nailed it. You nailed it. Um, yeah. So he, he started reaching out to his brother. I need a list of mental health providers that you would recommend. Um, you know, I, I've gone down a rabbit hole. He said things like I've gone down a rabbit hole. Um, his brother kind of said, I think there was one point where he was out of town. He said, can I get back to you? He said, does your nurse practitioner have anyone? Um, finally got him in to see, um, finally got him in to see um, this psychiatrist and, um, you know, according to her notes, um, you know, she stated that, um, oh, he said he's been depressed for a while, wasn't too happy at his last job, which I knew he didn't love his last job, but he still was, he loved his coworkers. He, I think he really missed clinical nursing at the children's hospital here that he had done Mm -hmm. for almost 20 years. And, um, but I think in his mind, he thought, well, I'm 50, I can't be a floor nurse forever. Um, but I think he really just missed that. And um, so I, I know he, even though he said that, I think it was kind of the Zyprexa telling him that he was depressed a little bit. And because he still, he loved his coworkers. He, you know, he loved his friends. He went out, he loved his family. It wasn't like he mm-hmm. was in bed because he was depressed from his job. Um, and so he you know, he talked to this psychiatrist and so she, um, increased the dose of the Zyprexa. Um, he was on five milligrams. She increased it to 10. Um, and there was really, I don't think there was anything in there about we'll follow up. I don't think, and, and I don't know about this, if there is a, you know, with when they're referred to a psychiatrist, is their communication between the primary care. If someone gets to be that bad and then they're referring to a psychiatrist, shouldn't there be communication between, you know, the Mm -hmm. the primary care and the psychiatrist on, but I don't, I I don't believe there was any of that. Um, And yeah. And I, he was sent home, increased his dose to 10 milligrams. um, And the next day I got up, um, I could tell he, he, looked at me and said he hadn't slept all night long. Um, and he just had this look in his eye of just, you know, fear. I just said, okay, I went to work and I was sitting there at work and thought I need to go home. He just, he wasn't right. I just need to go home. Um, so I went home and he was just pacing and just pacing and just said, I can't, I can't do this. I mean, he just had a look I've never seen in his face and just said, I can't do this anymore. I don't know what's wrong with me. I just can't do this. Um, and like he wanted to cry and he couldn't, and he was just, you know, just at almost like his mind was going to explode. And so Mm -hmm. I called his brother. He said, take him to the ER, took him to the ER. Um, his brother came to the ER and said, I have never seen this, John. I do not know this, John. And that was Mm -hmm. two months after being on almost two months to the day of being on the Zyprexa. Um, Mm -hmm. that he had been on that. And then he, you know, they, they checked him in and took him to the psych unit, um, where he was prescribed the SNRI, the Cymbalta. Um, and he came home, was very depressed. Um, you know, you could tell he probably just tried to make it through that psych unit, just knowing he wanted to get out of it. 
And and they, it seems like they also started to taper his Zyprexa, right? You know, they dropped it from 10 to 7.5. Was that right? Or, or was that afterwards? I think that was, that was after that was, so he was checked into the psych unit in February. Mm-hmm. I think the Zyprexa was tapered in um, March at his second visit with the psychiatrist. Okay. So a couple so things I that think- I, yeah, I was going to say just a couple things that I want to point to. One is going to be really obvious to a lot of people, but it's, you know, when we're assessing um, uh, drug, you know, the, you know, whether someone's uh, psychiatric symptoms are due to a drug, one of the things we really look for is uh, the temporal relationship and the dose response. So one, you know, John has new symptoms shortly after starting Zyprexa, but the day after he gets his dose increased, his symptoms intensify. He, he doesn't sleep all night and the pacing worsens. And, you know, literally the day after he's in a psychiatric unit. And I guess here's the other thing. I mean, just based on your last comment, it sounds like they didn't pick up on it even when he was in the psychiatric hospital because it sounds like he was only tapered later on. So now we have multiple people, I guess, missing what could be a, you know, you know, what, what really sounds like to me is a drug induced problem, you know, akathisia. Um, the other thing that I think happened in, in your husband's case, but I think is happening all over the, the, the country is, you know, p- people are not aware of what this looks like. And, um, you know, because of that, instead of, you know, the, the, I think it was the female psychiatrist or nurse practitioner he saw the day before he went in said, you know, increase the dose you know at that point she wasn't like well hang on a second this is new let's 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 stop it you know she 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 doubled the dose right. and and what i see going on um in i guess in mental health in the us is there's not an awareness of drug induced problems and it's so much you know for providers it's so much more defensible you know when you have someone who's looking severely ill you know if, and if you don't recognize what it looks like and you're doing a fairly quick assessment it's a lot easier to say oh this is severe depression you know i'm just going to increase the dose that's defensible right. there's a whole bunch of protocols out there that say this is what you do for treatment resistant depression you know these symptoms they somewhat fit treatment resistant depression i assume this provider didn't really do a temporal history where they looked at what had happened over time in relation to the starting of the drug and it just seems it's just so much easier for providers to just say you have this condition and you know this is what's in the treatment guidelines exactly. and the and the protocols and just start it it almost feels safer than oh no you know this is a drug induced side effect and when you get there believe me and i work in this space there's, there's not a lot of guidelines and, uh, on how you get someone out of this problem. You know, it's, it's not something that's written about a lot in the medical literature. So it's confusing for people and they don't know how to do it. And so I just see this tendency where, you know, they just add more treatments. And, and so that's something that I also think is interesting. So, um, well, uh, like you yep. had said, you know, there wasn't a lot of training on, you know, there wasn't a whole lot on, on things like that. And so mm-hmm. but I, it makes me wonder about, I mean, is it, is it kind of in a way a cognitive dissonance with docs that I, that, I mean, I think they have to be slightly aware that these meds can cause this kind of harm. Like, I, I feel like they have, they kind of, maybe they don't, I, I, I don't know, but I would, yeah. would some of them, most of them take the meds they prescribe. And I don't know if most of them would. You know, I know some docs that are on meds, but I don't, I don't know I've, if most docs yeah. can take the meds. Well, I, I can give you kind of, yeah, I, I'll give you kind of my download. It's, it's sort of been something that I've been thinking about for years. Uh, you know, how, how did we get in? And the reason that I came to this was, you know, when I was learning about all of these problems and going through my own training, I realized that, you know, if I ever needed a psychiatrist or a loved one of mine ever needed a psychiatrist, I would have so little faith in, um, you know, in just sending them to someone, you know, nearby. I would have to personally know them if I, w- I was to do that. And that, and that, and, and where that was coming from, I think, was my recognition that I was just, um, you know, seeing this kind of production line, just like, in for 10 minutes, you're going to get this medication. And they just kind of just kept on lumping them on. There's, there's hardly any kind of uh, psychotherapy or, or counseling. And so, and then I, 
you know, as I went further into it and I saw that there were all these terrible problems happening with drugs, you know, drug induced suicide and homicide, but also the protracted withdrawal injuries, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of now, Naomi, right. from, from your own research. Um, and so, you know, since that time I worked at the FDA, I've actually worked at several pharmaceutical companies and drug safety roles. So I've had an opportunity to kind of be behind the veil and see what goes on in regards to safe, you know, the, you know, how safety information gets out there. And, and, and here's my download. Here's what I think is happening. People, um, physicians, NPs, all of that, they get their information from medical journals. Um, and drug companies, um, they have uh, a huge amount of resources and, a hu- and, and those resources go mostly towards um, almost, you know, publishing articles that almost have a positive tilt towards things. I mean, there's, there's a lot more right. articles that talk about the positive effects of drugs. You know, they have whole teams working on these. I've been a part of these teams. You know, we're going to, you know, we're going to create 10 articles that we're going to get in the top journals and we're going to do this plan over the next two years. And there's no regular, there's no regulator, you know, at the FDA saying, Hey, oh, by the way, you need to publish this many safety manuscripts where you talk about these problems and the risk mitigation for that. That um, that's that's not part of a regulation. So, and what happens is, you know, when a drug company has a risk, the FDA will make them label it, or or, or sometimes the drug company wants to put it in their label on their own. But physicians are not taught how to even find drug labels. It was nothing that I ever learned in my training. You know, you could go to the website daily. It's called dailymeds.com. And you can go and you can look up all of the labels there. I was never taught it. My wife trained in New York at Mount Sinai. She was never taught it. I talked to family medicine colleagues of mine. They were never taught how to do it. Even going to drug labels and reading these things, is it's not something that you... Um, you know that that that's taught, which is um, which is awful because if new side effects come out about drugs, so they go into a drug label and no one ever learns about them. And the main one that's that's happening with at the moment is protracted withdrawal injury, which is now recognised by the FDA. But people are still getting injured every day, and it's being missed because no one knows what it is, even though it's been in there since 2020. Um, so. Yeah. So what what we have is a huge amount of resources and sales teams which skew the medical literature to focus on the positive. And then even when there's a, you know, there's a kind of a negative sign or a side effect, it can be spun in a way where it's like, you know, um, you know, I, I don't think I've ever heard of someone talking, you know, uh, you know, a mainstream psychiatrist talking about drug induced suicide without saying, Oh, by the way, but there's still a little bit of controversy right. around it. You know, we're not really sure if this is right. is real, and and it's all spin. You know, it, it it's real. It's in it's in the label, but it's it's always presented in a way to kind of sow doubt, and that gives it less weight. You know, when it trickles through into the community, practitioners who they know a lot about the efficacy of the drug, but because the way things are set up, um, they don't know a lot about the risk. So. I don't think there's anything malicious about it. I actually work with a lot of mental, you know, I, I know people from within medicine, even mental health providers who've been snared up in the same thing because they're, they're all getting their information from the same place. And it's just this byproduct of what information you promote. And, you know, when you have a lot of resources to promote one idea, the other thing gets ignored. So, I mean, that's my overall sense of how, how this is happening. Yeah. And I, yeah. And I don't think, yeah. I don't think, think the doctors are malicious or even, you know, drug companies over making these pills. So people go out and kill themselves. I mean, I, I mean, I think there's money to be made, but I don't, Mm -hmm. I don't think anything's malicious, but I, I tend to think, I mean, maybe there are the medical journals and they read it, but knowing that there are side effects and then just kind of gaslighting those side effects to me just seems Mm -hmm. like in a way, a little bit of cognitive dissonance where it's just like, okay, just focus on, you know, focus on what I've been told. And, and I mean, everyone's so different. I mean, we do a better job at warning people about peanut oil than we do in peanuts and allergies mm-hmm. and side effects of peanuts than we do about what comes in these medications and what it can do to people. So, yeah, I mean, there, there's also, so, I mean, there's, there's an intimidation aspect to it, which I've also unfortunately seen more of lately where, you know, if, if you're someone who talks about the risks of medications 
you get, you know, you, you get written off as someone who is just trying to say meds are bad. Right. You know, people shouldn't take meds right. and um, you know, you're stigmatizing mental illness. You're just another person out there who's making it harder for people to get treatment. And so there's this almost this bullying and intimidation going on where, you know, this is just said all the time where people are just like, Oh, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to do it. But even that is, um, you know, in, you know, in a, yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that's like another thing that goes on and, <laughs> and, you know, you'll have drug companies and they, and they can give resources to spe- specific groups out there who say a lot of these things as well. You know, they can choose which groups they want to fund, you know, and if maybe it's, you know, there, there's a group out there that's supportive of depression. I mean, they're not trying to help them sell drugs, but they're talking a lot about, oh my God, you know, we need to stop stigmatizing medications and mental illness that, that can be funded. And then that message really comes out. Um, and so there's right at the end, it's, it's, it's a commercial agenda. You're like, you know, this is a good idea. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to invest in this group of people because, you know, they're talking about, you know, how, how treatment resistant depression is underdiagnosed and about how, you know, they're pr- promoting, you know, let's fight against the stigma of mental illness, all of these things in and of themselves, they're not, you know, there's, there's nothing sinister about them, but when you couple it together with all of the other things going on, it just has this effect where it quells any kind of discussion about this and recognition of the problem. Yeah. And that is, yeah. I, I'm not anti, I'm not anti-drug. I'm, I think modern medicine has a, a great purpose, but um, yeah, I wouldn't want someone not getting help that, that they needed. Absolutely not. But you know, the, like, like you said, you've seen maybe one third be helped with, you know, medications and the other two thirds, there can be, you know, significant side effects from it. And sure. I mean, yeah. that's, you know, just a couple, I mean, all the articles I've read, you know, there was one, um, Dr. John Reed, I think, um, mm-hmm. a professor out of the UK and did a study of about 1500 people and um, 50% of them said, you know, they had suicidal thoughts of after being on antidepressants and 60% saw a decrease in positive feelings and 70%, you know, came very um, just detached. And, and, mm-hmm. and so it just, do we, you know, you don't want the people who need the medication to not get it, but that seems, I know that studies from drug companies, like you said, can kind of sway that and turn that into making it look like a a higher number than, than what's really, Mm -hmm. what's really being reported. And when you hear these personal stories, it just, it just is heartbreaking. Absolutely heartbreaking. So you went off on a little tangent there. No, no, but it's a, it's a good tangent. And, uh, you know, I I enjoy the interviews that go like this because these, this is, this is the meat, but yeah, I I feel the same way. You know, I'm not anti-drug, you know, it, it, you know, the problem is it's how the drugs are being used, you know, and, and it's how they're, you know, there's a lack of monitoring for these problems, you know, not only have I seen people helped by, you know, antidepressants, I've seen some people helped on like, you know, five different drugs, you know, you'd say this is some crazy polypharmacy and they're on a million things. And that just occasionally that will work for someone. So, you know, in the right hands and done correctly with monitoring, I mean, for certain people, they're helpful, but we're, we're in a situation, it's not just the US, it's, it's all over the place, honestly, where, somehow, you know, mental health has become this kind of production line thing where you come in, you get a 10 minute visit and you just get a med. And if that med doesn't work, you get a higher dose, eventually you get a new med and you just accumulate them until something breaks. And, and, you know, like your story with, you know, with your husband with, with tragic consequences. Um, So, but yeah, let's, let's, let's get back on track. Like you mentioned. So he, he goes into the hospital, he gets pulled off the Lexapro, he gets put on Cymbalta and he leaves on Cymbalta, on a new medication, Cymbalta with some Zyprexa. Tell, tell us about the next three months mm-hmm. after that. Um, he just, he ended up, he had a three month um, FEMLA he could have taken. He chose to resign after one month. Um, there was paranoia with that too, that, um, his boss wasn't able or his boss wasn't able to talk to him because HR was telling him um, not to, or telling her not to talk to him. And I just, I mean, some of the things that he was saying, I was, I just thought there's, there's paranoia here. Um, And 
I just said, you know, let's take the three month. No, no, I can't. And he, like I said, he's had two hip replacements, taken femlas in the past um, and absolutely loved it. He loved being home. He cooked dinner. He helped the boys with homework. He, you know, he loved taking that. He, he would get excited. I'm taking my femla and he would get excited to do that and be home with the, be home with the family. And this was, you know, after one month, he just chose to resign um, so now we're out of insurance and, and, um, he's struggling to, yeah, to find a new job and he's making flashcards. Um, you know, there was one point where I asked, he had had a stroke in the past, this poor guy, <laughs> he had had a stroke in the past. And, um, I called his brother because he kept just saying my memory, my memory, my memory. And, um, I had called his brother and said, can we get him an MRI? He's had a stroke. And his brother said, oh, yeah, I forgot about the stroke. Um, I forgot about the stroke. Yeah, let's get an MRI ordered. So and this just, I just want to say, this was 20 years ago, and he had no residual deficits, right? He, he'd completely recovered um, mostly, right? No, oh. it, wasn't, it wasn't 20. It was um, 2014 when he had the stroke. Okay, I think. all right. 2014, yeah. It's about six years and ago. So so no, yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he, yeah, he, no, he didn't have any, I mean, he had a PFO closure, it was from a PFO and, and had a closure, okay. you know, from that. Um, and a PFO, yeah, just, have, just for those listening, it's a patent for, foramen of Ali, it's a heart deficit where you can have clots that move through your heart, they're usually blocked by your lungs, but if you have this little hole, it can go from... Yeah, you know, you could have like a DVT kind of shoot through your heart, avoid your lungs, and head up into your brain. Yeah, right. And he had just yeah. had his he had just had his veins stripped. So yeah, <laughs> he had, yeah. He had, he had, he'd been through the ringer. So yeah, so that's what kind of brought that on. So yeah, no deficits from that. Um, and so his brother said, "Yeah, he got the MRI, um, and it came back." You know. Um, I remember talking to him that day and he was, he was pretty, he was pretty depressed that not the MRI didn't show anything either. Um, and he said, I'm just crazy. I'm just crazy. And I said, you're not. And there's a text to his brother and his brother said, you know, your MRI looks fine. Um, and he texts back, then I'm just crazy. And his brother texted and said, yep. Followed by two laughing, crying eye emojis. And mm. that really that's, that's a hard one because I, I knew how that, even though he had said, I know it's going to come back normal. Um, he was pretty distraught about that. And, um, his brother responded that and just said, I think stress and memory, if I think stress and anxiety or, you know, stress can really affect our memory and just brushed it off. Yeah. Um, I asked, I had asked for a kind of a family intervention to just kind of, you know, these meds aren't working, what's going on. I had asked for a family intervention with his brother and his mom. Um, and we sat down and, you know, I said, this isn't working. This isn't my husband. I don't, I don't know what's, this is not my best friend. And, mm -hmm. um, his brother just said, you know, well, it takes, and this was in March. He had been out of the psych unit for about a month. Um, well, it takes about a month to, for the meds to kick in. And so according to his logic, you know, in February, after being two months on the, the Alonzapine, then there should have been a change in him with the Zyprexa or Alonzapine at that time. But his brother just did the, you know, the typical, it takes four to six weeks for the meds to kick in, which I've mm -hmm. seen a lot of people say, I mean, even after a couple doses, it can completely change them. And that's mm -hmm. what they'll be told is, well, it takes four to six weeks. Give it some time. Yeah. Give it some time. And, and it's, this, it's this underlying presumption that you are sick because of your underlying condition. It's not the drug that's exactly. causing this, even though we know that, that it can cause it fairly rapidly within, you know, one or two doses, you can develop akathisia, but it's completely, you know, missed. And it's, yeah, you know, a presumption that it's the underlying illness, which is, you know, was not the case. And like you said, a lot of the side effects mirror the mental health issues, you know, mm -hmm. the, the anxiety, oh. the paranoia and things oh. like that. Yeah, they, they, they can and be that's... hard to tease out. I mean, I mean, with, with 
John, though, I mean, I, I, I will say, I mean, some of the things like the degree of cognitive impairment, I've seen cognitive impairment from depression and anxiety when someone's not on any medications. They don't come in saying, you know, that I'm losing my mind. I, I need flashcards to remember things, you know. You know, they, they don't come in, you know, pacing around the place and shaking when that has never been a manifestation of their previous condition. It's just, I mean, nothing is 100%, you know, slam dunk, this is what it is, but it's this cumulative right. thing when you see so many things that just don't really fit and they occur shortly after someone's taking the drug and then they amplify to the point where he goes to a psychiatric hospital a day after the dose is increased. When, when you have all of these converging lines of evidence, I mean, it is more likely that it's a drug problem than your, you know, then, oh, you know, your depression and your anxiety completely morphed into a completely new set of symptoms, which is severe and unusual. I mean, it's just, that's, that's, that's how we think about things um, when we're doing these evaluations, but yeah. Yeah. So he, um, so the, the family intervention, MRI, and then just after that, it was just, I could just see how he was struggling to get through to get through every day and how this new job just seeing my husband try so hard just to be his 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 old self as a dad be a husband it was almost like he had to seriously just focus on I, I don't, I can't explain the look I saw in his eyes. I, ca I can't explain it, but he just tried so hard, I think, to be his old self when he, he couldn't even, I, I don't even think he could tell me after hearing other stories of akathisia and some of the thoughts that go through people's heads, I think he had some pretty dark thoughts and I don't think he, he could tell me those, um, you know, he would show up at our son's lacrosse game after work and just have this look of, and I'd say, how was your day? And he'd just, he'd just look at me and just shake his head like this. And he would just look at me like, help me, help me. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's a lady. Um, oh, go ahead. And I was going to say, you know, one of, one of the things that happens when you have these drug induced, I guess, psychiatric problems you know, we like to think that we're in control of our thoughts, but they stem from our mood. You know, you know, if we're in a happy mood, we're more likely to have happy thoughts. If we're down or we're tired, we're more likely to have different, more depressing thoughts. When you're in one of these drug-induced states, you know, he, he was in a state of, I, I guess I would say, intense dysphoria and also, I guess, sadness and agitation. I mean, he, he was making decisions that clearly didn't benefit the family. He impulsively, I guess, quit his job when he could have been on FMLA with like yeah. benefits. And, and I mean, you could only imagine the things going through his mind. I mean, I don't know him, but I'd imagine, oh my God, I'm a failure. I'm not being, I'm not supporting my family. You know, I'm not this and that, like I can't cook and clean like I used to. I can't, you know, be there for my boys. Yeah. You know, my wife is, you know, I can see that my depression is wearing on my wife. What kind of man am, am yes. I? And this is just so amplified when you're constantly, you know, in this drug-induced dysphoria, all you have is negativity and hopelessness and despair. Um, and, and, and that's a very common experience. Yeah. And that was, that was him. That was him. Um, yeah. you know, the night before he died, um, I had gotten upset and, you know, that's in my article I talk about, I had gotten upset with one of my son's lacrosse coaches and, and we got home and we were laughing about it the boys and I, and he just kind of had this look. And I said, you stayed calm. I said, you know, you stayed calm. I said, I need to take what you're taking. And he looked me in the eyes, dead in the eyes and said, you do not want what I am taking. And that, mm -hmm. that was he, so he knew. And like I said, I think he, you know, I told you that I think he cold turkeyed off both of them because he knew, he knew it was the meds. And, you know, after, I confronted his brother after John died and just said, you know, you prescribed him this, this med, um, you know, his, it's, um, it, he just, sorry, sorry, Dr. Yosef, I lost my train of thought there. Um, but that's, that's okay. he, yeah, he, I think he quit cold Turkey cause he knew it was the meds that had changed him. And so, um, yeah. And you knew this because. Be because you because you found 
pill bottles afterwards and they were completely full. Yeah. Yeah. They were completely full, unopened of, um, I think he had talked to his brother probably about tapering off um, Mm -hmm. Cymbalta. And so he had been prescribed the 30 milligrams, um, three bottles of 30 milligrams. um, And uh, those were completely, yeah, completely full, unopened. Um, and, And his brother told me in a text, well, I don't know what John was taking. He was adjusting his own meds. And last thing, last thing he told me, he was just gonna go back on his Lexapro. Yeah. And so, John knew that these, these aren't helping me. And, you know, he had started and stopped Lexapro for so many years that I don't think he, even as a nurse, you know, I mean, even doctors don't know how to taper correctly. And so um, I just think uh, he quit cold turkey. And there's an, I mean, there's another thing, I mean, from, from the history, it sounds like, I mean, John is already doing impulsive things as well. You know, there's no, safe plan of like okay hey john you have this problem we're going to help we're going to safely taper you down he's kind of sitting there in his own kind of agitated despair and then it's like i mean how much agency does he really have at this point to just say you know he's just adjusting his meds you know it's up to him you know and it's like well he's not really acting like himself anyway um you know there's something you know, he's not acting in the best interest of his family, you know, things, there's a, there's a number of things that would suggest that he's not, you know, he's, he's not himself. Hmm. Well, and that's, what's really hard too, is processing that of, this isn't just, this isn't just a doctor that, you know, you see in the office for a couple minutes and he, this is his brother. This is his brother. Who's, who's missing all these, these signs You know, and and for his brother to say after he passed that, well, he must have just dealt with this all his life. And it's like, no, I lived with Mm -hmm. him for 26 years. He never, he never dealt with this. He never was, he was, he was such an involved dad from the time my boys were born. I mean, anytime he was mowing the lawn, he had him in a baby backpack. I mean, he would go on field trips. He would always help in the classroom. I mean, he was just a, this, and, and everyone who knew him knew it, knew how much he adored his family. And mm-hmm. that's just it. And that's, you know, he, I just knew from the minute I found him, he just, just was not my husband. Just wasn't. Sure. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, within an I Go ahead. No, 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 I, no, you, you go. Yeah. I just, what, you know, the, the day it happened, um, you know, April 30th coming up on that. And, you know, I could tell he was just kind of off. Um, and I just said, okay, I'm going to go pick up our son. He was at the high school um, for some youth lacrosse games. And I said, I'm going to go pick up, you know, do you, Finn, do you want to come? And he said, he said, no, you just go. And I said, okay, I love you. And, and left. I was gone for probably an hour and a half. And, um, you know, I, my dad came over one time and asked, you know, during this, during the five month period and asked, Hey, should we take the guns out of the house? And I said, no, John would never do that. Um, you know, the psychiatrist notes in her, there's a suicide plan, remove lethal means from the house. But that, that's never conveyed to, like, I, I'm not even aware, like, in my head when he was going through all this, like, it didn't even cross my mind that it could be the meds. It didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind, oh, okay, so what meds are you on? I knew I had told him, I had said, so when your insurance kicks in, I'm going with, we're going back to the psychiatrist. Um, because at that time he had made a little comment about his brother that I think he was, he was feeling like his brother wasn't listening to him. Mm -hmm. Um, and I said, I'm going back to the psychiatrist with you and we're going to talk about the meds you're on because they're not working. Yeah. And, um, I had told him that and our, that would have been a Monday when our insurance kicked in and he died on a Saturday. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I mean, so after, after all of this happens, um, you go on your own journey um, and you start looking into things. Could you, um, I mean, it's, 
I mean, it's obviously, you know, if I if I were to think about it, I mean, it's it's, I mean, your 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 whole life changes in in five months. You know, you've got, you know, you and John, you have two young sons, and within the space of five months, they they lose their father, you lose your husband. I mean, it is about the worst thing that could possibly happen to anyone. And let's let's talk about um, what happened after that. You know, after after you you know you come home, you know you know john dies because i found you in the symbol in, in one of the symbolta facebook groups you know oh no no sorry it was the uh, uh, marriages destroyed by ssli um, facebook groups right. yeah and and so you've been yeah. on your own journey after that looking for answers tell us about that journey um yeah i just i mean my sister kind of brought up the symbolta um yeah. and you know and even john's mom his brother's wife his brother's son all said they knew it was the medication it had to be the medication um but when the zyprexa was mentioned then it was no longer the medication i mean everyone who knew john knows it had to be the medication just because of who he was and he worked with doctors and nurses and you know they they can see it i mean it just wasn't john i want to make a point here because I, i don't think i stress this enough John went to see his brother originally because he had started a new job and he was stressed about his mother's physical health. And right. so the severity of his symptoms, you know, uh, compared to the contextual stresses in his life, they're just so out of proportion as well. So, yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that, I, not, I don't yeah. know anyone who knew him could, could look at it and go, that's what it has to be, you know? And so, you know, after, yeah, the funeral, everything, um, I just said, I need to get his records because maybe there was something, maybe he was super depressed and I didn't know it. And maybe he, maybe he had something traumatic that he talked about in therapy and I didn't know. And maybe there's something in his medical records that I didn't know. And so, I, I had to just look for it just because like you said, five months of what happened, what happened to my amazing husband? You know, we weren't just husband and wife. We were best friends. We did everything together. And I knew how much he loved me and his boys. And he would never do something like that ever. He would never put this kind of pain on myself or, or his boys. He just would never do it. And so I had to get his records. I had, I had to just see if there was something that I didn't know. Mm-hmm. And the only thing was, was Zyprexa, yeah. which, which was given in December. And that's when things started to go downhill. And, you know, we have this cascade where the, you know, the Zyprexa side effect, the dose is doubled. It intensifies and worsens. He's rapidly swapped onto Cymbalta. And then towards the end, it seems like he he just stops taking it cold turkey while he's in this dysphoric state. And it's you can just you can see how you know the events are linked are linked together in that way. Yeah. And it's so and like we talked about, you know, failed on so many levels of um, primary care physician, psychiatrist, psych unit. I just. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it just is, you know, when he went to the psychiatrist, why, why she didn't say, okay, wait a minute, you know, let's, let's look at this. You were prescribed Zyprexa, like just why there wasn't more reassessment instead of just, okay, you're presenting as this. So here's a pill. Let's just bandaid it, you know, Mm -hmm. which, um, instead of just that, that reassessment of you've been on this for two months now, just a little bit more caring, I guess, a little bit more caring. And, and, you know, why, why family members aren't called in and, and talk to if there is, you know, a risk for suicide or they're presenting as that, that, Hey, you need, I mean, they can find other ways besides guns, but, you know, and I, I'm I'm also giving you this drug that has a black box. I mean, Zyprexa doesn't, but Cymbalta does. We are giving you this oh, drug. Zyprexa does. 
I think Cyprexa oh, does Cyprexa? as well. Well, uh, okay. When it's when it's used in comp, it's 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 stupid. But you know, there's, so there's a class wide warning for all antidepressants in the U.S. And so when Zyprexa is right. used with another antidepressant, you know, the black box supplies, but it it is in the label for Zyprexa. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, the the black box warning talks about young adults and not really you know, middle-aged men. And, and I, I just don't believe that warning. I believe that that warning applies to all ages. Um, I found out in this journey too, that after, you know, um, one of my sons has a friend that he's played lacrosse with for a lot of years and his mom's brother was prescribed Zyprexa within five months, same thing within five months. Um, they've read my story, said it sounded ex all the memory things. Um, I don't know who I am memory. He was displaying all the same, all the same things, you know, yeah. in his thirties, kids. I mean, it just, it's, you know, the Zyprexa, the Zyprexa Facebook page, the Cymbalta Facebook page. I mean, all of that, you hear these stories of akathisia and these sim symptoms and side effects. And it's just, it's just heartbreaking. It's yeah. really just heartbreaking. I mean, and the, and the other thing about, um, John, I think John's death, which was classic, I guess, for uh, drug-induced suicides, is it's it's impulsive, and and by that I mean is there was no, there was no preparation there. There was no suicide note. Um, there was no getting your orders in affair into affairs. It was he was seemingly okay, and then just like that, no note to his kids, no note to you, just done. And that is really. Um, and it gives you an insight into kind of like the mental state. I mean, it, th these things happen really impulsively, you know, it's, it's just, it can just be for like a five minute period where you're intensely suffering and, 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 and you go and do something like that. And, and that's, and, and that's common in, um, also acts of violence, uh, drug induced acts of violence as well. They're really, really impulsive and out of character. Yeah. And yeah, and that's, I mean, reading Lindsay mm. Clancy's story, you know, the, the mom recently with the three little kids and I mean, she was a nurse and sound like she'd been, you know, poly drugged um, mm -hmm. for 10 months or, and I just, as soon as I read her story, I just thought, oh my gosh, that poor, poor woman. And that's what my friends, my girlfriends and I have talked about is if John could have had thoughts of harming his family and mm -hmm. I could see him. I mean, I don't know if there's any rationale there, but those thoughts might've scared him or, you know, anything like that of, Oh my gosh, yeah. like, who am I? Mm -hmm. Who am I? Yeah. And I, I, yeah. I believe too, that his was so, um, just, just so what they call like a command hallucination or whatnot, that it was just, mm -hmm. you know, just in the moment of, yeah. Because, yeah. He just would have never, had he, had he non, had he been aware enough to say, okay, you're going to kill yourself. He would have, he would have tried to make that not happen. You know, he would have talked himself out of that. If, I mean, knowing the harm it would have done to me and the boys. So. And, and so now, I mean, to, to kind of bring this uh, interview towards, uh, you know, a conclusion fairly soon, I want to ask, um, this is really soon and you, and you don't need to have an answer for this yet, but what do you do with something like this moving, moving forward? I mean, how, um, I guess, you know, this kind of experience, how has it, I guess, changed your life? And, you know, I guess what, and in terms of like, what do you, what, what are you doing now? You know, after you've had this experience? Um, <laughs> Try to make it through every day. Yeah. Um, sorry, I really didn't want to cry in this. Um, no, I just, as I move towards like wanting to be an advocate, um, I want like a national registry of suicide. Like we have black box warnings on these medications. Why when someone commits suicide, or why when someone, we have it for opioids, why isn't there a database that these people who are on medications with suicide warnings put into a database? And why aren't these recorded? If, you know, the drug companies are doing their own research, 
why are we not keeping track of that and and seeing how these drugs can really affect i want more informed consent i want yeah. I want doctors to really listen and listen to these personalized stories. You know, my mm-hmm. husband's story is not the only one and it won't, it won't be the only one. There's going to be a lot more. And, and as we push people more towards mental health, mental health, people are just going to their primary care physicians. And I read something that's about 70% um, of people are prescribed antidepressants by their primary care physician. And yep they're not, we're not giving families awareness. I mean, in John's case, let's go back to when he was having those normal life circumstances. Mm -hmm. How different do you want to be on this med? It can cause this, this, and this, or, Hey, let's get you in to talk to someone first. You know, what are you exercising? I mean, I mean, how often are you exercising? What are you eating? How much sleep are you getting? Let's, let's have you do that for a month and kind of keep kind of keep that in check like and then let's revisit maybe medication yeah. you know and I know people come in in a lot more agitated state than John but there's a lot of people that just go there because I mean the way I I feel anxiety now and depression um more than I ever have in my life now which is completely understandable and I would love a pill I would love for a pill to just take it away but there's no way I'm going I know meditation I know Mm -hmm. counseling I know all those things that I have to do um to try because everyone is going to experience anxiety and and depression but yeah moving forward I just I want informed consent given to patients and their families and really take those those black box warnings and those side effects and taken seriously yeah well You've taken a step in that direction today. I mean, you know, your interview uh, is the first one that I'm doing on someone who's had a, uh, you know, been close to someone with a drug-induced suicide. And my hope is that it gets out there and that, you know, it doesn't, you know, the warning doesn't just become a couple words on a drug, but it helps, you know, your description of how this unfolded gets out there so people can recognize it, um, you know, before something terrible happens. Um, And so... I want to thank you so much for coming on and, and, you know, and sharing your story and I will do everything I can to get it out to as many people as possible so they can learn about these things and we can prevent tragedies from occurring in the future. Well, and Dr. Yosef, I thank you. Thank you for being, you know, a voice in the medical community for this. I, I really appreciate that. So thank you. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. No problem. Well, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, I'm, I'm going to end, end the interview now, okay? And uh, you go have, okay. have a nice evening, okay? And thank you. Okay, thank you.